God's will. Amen. Makes me take a hard look at where I am and stop making excuses for my sin, doesn't it? Oh, praise God. And learn that I can do all things through him, through God, amen, who gives me the strength, amen. Well, praise the Lord this morning. We're going to go to the word of God. I'd like you to get your Bibles and go to Paul's epistle to the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians this morning, 2 Thessalonians, and we're going to be in the third chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. When you find it, I'd like you to stand for the reading of the Word of God. We're going to be reading one verse into our hearing this morning. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and we're going to be reading the sixth verse. You're going to go ahead, say amen if you're there. Amen. Let's read the Word of God together, and here's what it says. It says, now we command you, brethren, somebody say brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother. Somebody say brother. That walketh dishonestly, do, excuse me, disorderly, and not after the, the tradition which he received of us. Amen. I command you, brethren, in the name, didn't we just get through talking about that name? In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received, somebody say received, received of us. Amen? Amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord this morning. We're going to talk about a very difficult topic today, very hard area to preach about. Very uncomfortable area. Amen. But when we shy away from the things that are uncomfortable, we never grow. I want to talk to you this morning about one of the most difficult aspects of the Christian walk. And that is knowing who you can walk with. I'll say that again. The most difficult aspects of the Christian walk is knowing who you can walk with. The reason this is so difficult is because as believers, we should all have hearts that have been softened and tenderized by the love we have received through our relationship with Jesus Christ. And we've learned to be forgiving, haven't we? Long-suffering, haven't we? Patient and forgetful of past Hurts and past offenses. Amen. As a believer, we've learned that. In short, church, we have sought to become more and more like our Savior by becoming less and less of ourselves. My father would put it this way, he would say, we start off with none of God and all of self. We later move to some of God and some of self, and hopefully we'll continue in our progression until it's all of God and none of self. Amen? We're on this walk. It's a hard walk. 
Who do you walk with? Scripture tells us over and over and over again that our walk with Jesus must be a sacrificial one. Galatians 2 and 20 says we're crucified with Christ. Amen? Amen. Romans 12 and 2 tells us we must not be conformed to this world. Amen. But transformed. Why? By the what? Renewing of our mind. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 tells us that we must be new creatures in Christ. Old things have what? Passed away. And behold, all things have become new. Colossians 3 and 5 tells us that we must mortify, murder, kill the sin in our members. Galatians 5 and 24 tells us we must crucify this flesh with its affections and lust. And Colossians 3 and 3 tells us that we must display a life that is dead to the pull and the tug of this world on our lives. And we must stay hidden with Christ in God. It's a sacrificial walk. It's a sacrificial walk. The question we've got to look at today is whether we're willing to live this sacrificial life out in front of not only the unsaved. Amen? Oh, yeah. We're not here today to talk about the unsaved. Amen? Amen? Amen. Are you willing to live this life out in front of the saved folk as well? What type of walk as saved people do we have? And what do other saved people say about our walk? Because church, we're here to what? Reach the lost. Huh? And who we are and how we walk and the example we show is what the lost needs to see. And if we're not having the right walk, then people cannot get saved by our example. But are you willing to tell a saved brother? Are you willing to tell a saved sister? Your walk ain't right, man. Something's wrong. You got to get this right. You got to stop doing that. Saved person can't live like that. Y'all listening to me? Let me tell you how powerful your example is. Your example is so powerful that Paul says that if a husband and wife are married and one of the spouses is not saved, he says, don't get divorced, stay together. Why? Because the saved spouse, the example of the saved spouse, will, somebody say will, shall, somebody say shall. Amen. It's just a matter of time. If they're living right in front of that unsaved spouse, the Bible says they will sanctify that spouse. That's the book. Amen. So don't give up. Don't give up. Are you willing to follow the Lord's commands when dealing with those brothers and sisters in the faith who refuse to live a life that reflects the Christian ideal? Or are we going to allow them to openly sin against God and never hold them accountable personally or as the body of Christ? As I said, it's a difficult area. It's one of the scriptures that people like to avoid, but we can't avoid it because it can hit really close to home. You might be dealing with a child. You might be dealing with a loved one. Amen. That fits this criteria. How do you deal with this and be in line with God's will for your life? You see, church, the scriptures do not place a requirement on the unsaved. 
The unsaved are not required to conform to certain behavior or standards of godliness. Amen? Amen. See, I can show up for a basketball game and sit up in the stands having not run, having not worked out, amen, eating my popcorn and my snicker bars and sucking down a Coke, amen. You know why? Ain't my job to play the game. But I guarantee you, Coach over there, <laughs> amen, if I was on the team, he would never have me on the team. But if I was on the team, amen, <laughs> amen, you let me have that kind of a lifestyle as a player. No, 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 son. Uh-uh. You're here to play basketball. Uh-uh. Your lifestyle has to change. What you eat has to change. When you go to sleep has to change. How you, oh, nobody wants to talk now. Uh-huh. See, the, 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 the standard of the Christian walk is not on the unbeliever. It's on the believer. These standards are imposed on the saved in order that God huh, can allow the example of the saved to be seen in the unsaved lives and therefore we be able to witness to them and they understand the work of and the love of God in the lives of individuals just like them. And in these recipients of what Martin Luther called or referred to as an alien righteousness, in other words, a righteousness that doesn't come from us, a righteousness that we can't create, and a righteousness that seems to come from somewhere else, God just gave it to us. Amen. We are recipients of this alien righteousness. Amen. We will, and I should say, the world will see a model of applied grace, hear a message of saving grace, have their hearts overwhelmed by God's amazing grace, repent of their sins, and find forgiveness and salvation at the feet of Jesus Christ. That's the hope. That's the hope. The saved are required to submit to the authority of God as commanded by his word. Where we make our mistakes, church, where we make our mistake is in trying to get people to submit to our authority. Uh -huh. The bottom line is that if a person is properly submitted to God and his word, there is never an issue with them submitting to the righteous and godly authority of his church. Amen. A person who refuses to submit to God and his word will never submit to the authority of the church. Never. In today's lesson, we find the Apostle Paul dealing with the people of Thessalonica, the, Thess the Thessalonians. And the people of this city seem to have been very unruly, ungovernable. It was reported to Paul that this spirit of insubordination and disobedience had made its way into the church. It had leaked into the fellowship. Oh, amen. Amen. And was causing trouble. And there were many faithful believers in the congregation who were having trouble trying to walk right now. Because all these unruly folk had come in and they were not being corrected. Oh, nobody wants to talk now. Amen. Huh? Amen. They knew the Lord. They knew God's requirements. But they were going to do it their way anyway. Amen. And they get into the fellowship and they start causing trouble. Amen. Ah, oh, they start gossiping. They start talking about people. Amen. They start, amen, creating problems here or there. They're living lifestyles that they know they can't justify. Oh, in front of the Lord. Amen. And they are coming into the church and they're trying to act as though, amen, everything's okay. And they're bringing that sense of this order into the congregation, so Paul had to respond to this issue. He lays out three very important sets of criteria here that we must consider when the church is required to address the concerns we're talking about today. Number one, when you see a determined disobedience, 
Do you hear me? A determined disobedience. See, Paul was very disturbed by the problem because when he wrote to them, he gave them a strict command. And here's what he said. We just read it. Withdraw yourselves from every brother, amen, or sister, that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Withdraw yourselves. This seems to be very extreme, doesn't it? An extreme position to take. Amen. A very extreme position for the believer to take. This is why Paul makes sure he is crystal clear when he lays down his reasoning for such criteria. Paul is not making a suggestion here. He's giving a command. His words to the, his words to the Thessalonian believers are this. Now we command you, brethren. Now we, what? Command you, brethren. He was talking to them. He's talking to us. The Holy Spirit is talking to us. The word command is so strong in the original Greek that it leaves no room for any misunderstanding. In the original Greek, the word is parangelo, parangelo, uh, and, and, and it means to order, charge, or give a command. Parangelo. The prefix of this word is para. Didn't we talk about that last week? Amen. The prefix of the word is para, which means to come alongside or come beside, right? It indicates that the Apostle Paul is not speaking from the standpoint of his opinion or personal preference. See, I think a lot of times people think that when we speak the word of God, people like to say, well, that's up to you, Pastor. Well, that's what you think. Well, that's your opinion. Well, I don't see it that way. Amen? You ever had people tell you that? Amen? So, no, no, no. That's what the word says. It has to apply to me. It has to apply to you. That's the way we are. Well, I don't really agree with that. I think we can look at it from this perspective. Oh, yes. Amen. Well, the word tells us, Paul says, I command you, Parangella, I command you, amen. He's indicating here that he's speaking as someone who has God given authority to command, to make demands on Christian believers, which reflect the same commands or demands that God himself would make on that individual. What is Paul saying here? Paul's saying, if God says that we can't do it, then you need to leave it alone. If God says that we need to do it, well, we better get busy. We don't get to tell God, amen, whether we're going to live for him or not, or how we're going to live for him. He has given us his instruction, and we have a responsibility to live it out, amen, in these last days. Are you listening to me today? We're in a world today, church. We're in a time today, church, where all of the rules have been relaxed. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, amen. All of the rules have been relaxed. Amen. Amen. We can do what we want. Oh, yes, that's what we say. Amen. We try to act as though our lives are up to us. No, my Bible says you were bought with a price. Huh? Glory to God. You are not your own. Amen. Therefore, glorify God in your bodies. Amen. Therefore, you don't get to do what you want to with your body. You don't get to do what you want to with your time. You don't get to do what you want to with your life. Your life is in God. I'm telling you, if somebody, amen, doesn't praise God for that. Why is it? No, because we believe that this thing is some country club, some little social club, some little thing we decide to do or get together and do every now and then when we feel like it. And the world is looking at us. Ain't anybody here? 
And the world is saying, why is it I would want to serve you? Huh? Why is it I'd want to serve with you, I'm sorry. Why is it I'd want to serve with you? Why is it I want to serve this God you're talking about? You don't even serve him. Paul goes on to tell the Thessalonians that in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh, on, walketh disorderly, right? You see that? That word withdraw is a Greek word stello, and here's what it means. It means to gather up, to pull together, to move oneself, or to withdraw. It is also used to describe the process of shortening the sails on a sailboat. To pull in all the loose, flapping sails or extra material that would otherwise hinder the ship and not allow it to move forward at maximum speed. At other places in Scripture, this word is used to describe a runner pulling up the long dangling ends of his robe so the loose ends would not hinder him or slow him down as he ran. This is literally where we get that saying to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. What this is saying is no, not that we can, amen, make, do everything for ourselves, but it literally means that we must do all we can to not be hindered by anything so we can effectively run our race. You see, we've allowed some people to hinder our race. So you can think about it. You think about it. There was a time where you would study your word a little bit more. You were a little bit more concerned about a few things. You were trying to walk it out a little bit better. You were, you were trying to walk a little straighter and a little narrower. Amen. We're a little straighter on that narrow way. Amen. But then there's some relationships that you allowed to kind of get into your life there. And, and this rule got relaxed and that got relaxed and wasn't really, and you don't have to really do that much now. And this is the case because, you know, we, 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 we value those relationships more than we do our walk with Christ. Oh, yeah, we still want to come to church. Oh, yeah, we still want to sing songs to Zion, sing songs of Zion to the Lord. We still want to do all of those type of things. But, you know, all that stuff, I've been thinking about it now. Had a man talk to me the other day. Well, you know, I'm thinking about that tithing thing, Pastor. I don't know about all that tithing. Now, God's going to love me anyway. I said, oh, yeah, he loves you. I said, do you know that, God, that everybody in hell God loves? Did you know that? Do you know that? He loves everybody. <laughs> I don't really believe that I got a tithe because, that, I said, well, that's, that's, you know, you can believe what you want to. I'm just saying you need to do what Scripture says. Because God gave us one way to do it. Oh, I don't, well, you know, I don't believe in all, all, that, all that fornication stuff you keep talking about. And you know what? You know, if I love somebody, if we in love, y'all don't want to talk. Huh? We ain't hurting nobody. Mm-hmm. Right? Well, I don't see nowhere in, in Scripture where Jesus said anything about homosexuality. He never told me that we, well, if I, I, I love another man that it would be a problem. He never told me if I was a woman and I loved another woman that there would be a problem. No, he, he, he loves us and he wants us to love one another. You all heard that too? Okay, I know you have. Mm-hmm. Actually, speaking to somebody the other day, and I said, you know, where do you go to church? And they're, well, I don't go to church. I said, why? Because my church is trying to say that homosexuality is not of God. I said, well, it isn't. Well, I don't believe that. And they're going to have to come around and understand that the Supreme, if the Supreme Court says that it's okay, well, the church better get in line with it. I said, what, 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 whoa. I said, the Supreme Court? It's above the Bible? Really? I didn't know that. I'll go back and check. Oh, 
like that. Because that's what that's the problem with you Christians. You don't know how to love people. That's what they'll say. Mm -hmm. Are you all still with me? Mm -hmm. And just as Paul was speaking to these Thess Thess Thessalonians, got it. He's speaking to our hearts as well. That we make an inward resolution to get rid of anything that would hinder our spiritual walk. Oh, are y'all here? That we tie up the loose ends of our lives and pull ourselves together. This would necessarily mean that we withdraw from certain Christians, not the world, because we're there to have an example for the world, not the world, because we want the world to come to Jesus, and we must be there to uh, offer them uh, Jesus. But withdraw yourselves from Christians who are openly rebellious, who have determined that they are going to be disobedient, and who refuse to get things right with the Lord. That might be your own child. Nobody here. That might be a loved one. Not that you don't love them. But praise God, there's certain things we can't support you in. Because you know what? You won't get right with Jesus. Amen. Oh, nobody wants to talk. Mm-hmm. I know. Paul is telling us here today that our failure to do this not only affects the walk, uh, excuse me, affects our walk, but could adversely affect the correction that the Lord may be using to bring those individuals that he's using to bring in the lives of those individuals in order that they may return unto him. Yeah. There's See, some of us that are there's some of us that are enabling people. some people and they're not and they're not ever going to ever do the right thing, going to do the right thing even though they know what even the right they thing know is, because the right thing is we because keep on we them keep on propping them up. I'm talking about Christians now. I'm talking about Christians. Keep on propping them up. Keep on propping them up. Because they won't do right. Because they won't do right. And so God can never so really correct them. Really because correct as soon as the correction of God comes, of God we dare to fix their stuff. We dare to fix their stuff. I don't. Ooh, wee. Ooh, wee, wee, wee. Look at the time. Amen. Amen. Y'all, I'm telling you. My wife and I, we've had to have some discussions about this. Because there are situations that we've seen in our own lives. There are certain things that we can't do in certain areas of our lives because, amen. Oh, you want to support your family. You want to support your children. You want to support those you love. But then you look and say, are they doing it God's way? Are we keeping them away from what God may need done in their lives Therefore, our help is hindering their faith. I don't want to stand in front of God one day and say, you know all that help you gave your boy? Yes, sir. Well, well, you're welcome. Huh? Right? Well, you know what? <laughs> it just kept him from finding the Savior like he should have. You know all that help you gave that person over there? Yeah, I did. I'm real, real proud of it too, God. I know you love me because I did all that great work for you. Oh, really? Well, did you know that all that help kept them from repenting? They didn't have to, they didn't, they never had to repent because you kept on propping them up. Believers know how to repent. We're not talking about the unsaved. We're talking about the saved. They know how to repent. They know how to come back to God. Give them room to do it. Give them room to do it. Oh, praise God. I know my father had to do that with me. Amen. That was the hardest thing to hear when I got myself into more trouble. Knew the Lord, been baptized a second time. Oh, help me, Jesus. Yeah, y'all, I needed it twice. And I got myself in such bad, I was in such a bad fix. And I remember going to my father's office and sitting down with him. Daddy, just one more time, I need this help. And I remember that man looked at me and said, not this time. He said, you have to work that out on your own. I said, what? <laughs> I had to go out and check the door, find out if it's out in the right, I'm in the right office. You are, you are my father, right? 
sometimes no, <laughs> no is what people need to hear. No, I'm not going to help you this time is what people need to hear. No, I'm not covering for you this time. Mm. No, you'll just have to find a way to get that worked out on your own. Ah. Mm. We did. Amen. Somebody say, I did. Amen. I did. Anybody that's truly saved knows that you had to get it worked out. At some point, somebody had to stop helping you. Keep staying. <laughs> Go over to the book of Luke with me. I, I won't be able to finish this today. I'm going to have to I have to come back to this. But you go over to the book of Luke. <laughs> and Jesus tells us the story in the book of Luke of the prodigal son. And let me get there. And what Jesus tells us in this parable is this. He tells us that there was a son who asked for his wages, asked for his living, you remember? And in the 15th chapter of Luke, this man who had two sons, Beautiful life, a wonderful home. But one of the sons comes to the father and says, give me everything that you have owing to me. And you know the story, and I'm not going to get into all the details of the story. <laughs> but the Bible says that in verse 15, after he had taken his journey into a far country, he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And this citizen sent him into the fields to feed his swine. And it said that this young man would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Now, I want you to not take this verse too lightly. I want you to look at it. He goes out trying to do his thing, wastes his life with riotous living, ends up losing everything. is sent to feed the swine, and was eating with the hogs. Amen. He filled his belly with the same husks of the, of the swine. Didn't want to do it, but he had to do it. He was hungry. Huh? And I want you to look at the last part of this verse. It says, and what? And what? And what? No man Gave unto him. Look at verse 17. Was the first thing we see in verse 17. And when he what? Came to himself. Y'all get this this morning. People aren't going to come to themselves if you keep giving to them. <laughs> you got to cut them off. Oh, Jesus. Huh? See, we know we're talking about the saved here because this was 
two individuals coming from the father's house. One individual decided to do it his way. Amen. We know the other individual stayed at home. Amen. That's another story. But this one here, amen, decided I'm going to do it my way, ended up losing everything. And guess what? Everybody was enabling him, enabling him. And as long as people kept enabling him, oh, guess what? He never got any better. Amen. Amen. Calling somebody, help me with this, help me with that. Can you get this for me? Can you do that for me? Amen. But when he got to a place in his life where nobody would give him anything. Somebody say, nobody. Uh Uh-huh. All right, listen. Are you hearing me? Then the Bible says that he came to himself. And he realized, my father has hired servants in his house. (laughs) That are doing better than me. Huh? Got enough bread to spare. And here I am about to die. He said in verse 18, I will arise. You see what happens? There must be, amen, a denial, amen, of benefits, a denial, amen, of health, a denial, amen, of anything, amen, that you can do for an individual who knows better but refuses to live for God in order that they will what? Come to themselves. And when they do, they will make the decision to return. I will arise and do what? Go back home. Go to my father. Go to what I know is right. And just tell him I've sinned against heaven and against you. I got to end it here today. We've got so much more to talk about in this area. But y'all, if you see individuals who have determined they're going to disobey. Christians who are living outside of the truth. Adults that know better. People who have the ability to do better, but refuse to do the right thing. And we keep on acting like, oh, it's all right. We listen to them say foolishness like, you know, God ain't through with me yet. Who's God? Who is God through with? Don't use that as an excuse. You're using that as an excuse not to do the right thing. Amen. God ain't through with any of us. Praise God for that. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Praise God. Amen. But there are people that will not live right, won't do right. There's some people, amen, amen, that are coming, amen, to church, amen, but they know they're not living right. They don't, they, they know that, and then their lives are full of secrets and shame and covered foolishness. Could your life be exposed today? Those of us who are living for Jesus and say we're living for Jesus, how much of our lives can stand exposure this morning? That's the question you have to ask. Why? Because when you know that you're living free in the things of God, when you know that you are doing the will of God, you have the ability of God, the strength of God, the power of God, the anointing of God, though to do the what? Work of God. Let's remember that today. Let's not decide to, to disobey. Look at your life this week and say, am I living in any area of disobedience to God? Have I decided that there's something in my life I'm going to do whether God likes it or not? Is there anything I'm doing that I couldn't say to the church, hey, church, I'm doing this? Well, then maybe you might want to consider whether we need to keep doing it. Amen? Amen. See, we're not talking about, of course, obvious things between husbands and wives and private family matters. No, 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 no. You know exactly what I'm talking about. What kind of life are we displaying because that is the life that God is going to hold us accountable to. Why? Because that life will either be drawing someone to Christ or pushing them away. I don't want to know that my example is not what bringing people into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen?
Amen. Amen. Let's just bow our heads today. Father, we give you praise right now. We give you glory right now. We thank you because you're good. That beside you there is none else. That you, dear Father, have decided that you are going to love us in spite of us. That you've given us hope. And you've given us grace. You've given us peace. You've given us joy. You've given us ability.